this is a Magic Leap that just only came out a few weeks ago. Um, huge investment from companies um, who make these kind of AR or mixed reality devices. And we'll talk about that later in a moment. Um, the first thing is about the concept of digital surgery, which is fairly new. We spent years talking about digital health and now digital medicine. Now we're embarking on this new concept of digital surgery, which is again, I think surgery as a discipline encompasses many things that we all think about, think about technologies that will impact healthcare around the world. We talk about the AI and how it's going to replace doctors. Um, now we think about AI and surgery, looking at more of the analytics around surgery as a whole, because surgery hasn't changed much over a long period of time. So the first thing to ask my audience, I'll just put this down here while we come back to that in a moment, is really a question. I ask my medical students, my trainees, consultants, and no one knows. It's really interesting. It's been a whole lifetime in surgery, you don't know what the actual word means. Any ideas from the audience? Interesting, isn't that right? So, two words, chair, from Latin word chair, which means the hand. Ergon, ergonomics, to work. Hand work, to work the hand. That's what it means. We have now developed that because the hands are much more sophisticated. Look at robotics, thinking about how we're going to change the way we interact with this hand that we have. How do you analyze how the hand moves? So actually, the world of surgery is going to be automated as we go on and be much more sophisticated than before. Let's go back 2001, 17 years ago. Jacques Morisco from France did the world's first operation that was Transatlantic. We have sound, please. Doctor is preparing for a surgery that will make medical history. That's because while he's in New York City, the patient that he's operating on is in France, 4,000 miles away. To accomplish remote surgery, you need to have a perfect robot. And you need to have a, a high-speed system. And that was a very, a very difficult to, to find. It's the latest in high-tech, ultra-modern medicine. That was 2001. Imaz that's amazing, isn't it, in terms of technology? With, possible with lines and communication. But we're moving on. The world is more connected now, of course, with Facebook putting drones into the air, with Microsoft laying cables on the Atlantic. And of course, Google with his project Loom putting balloons into the air. And now, of course, we have Elon Musk with his satellite vision of connecting people. So the question now, of course, we are more connected. So all this thing that we've seen in the past should be much more possible. With the prospect of 5G coming in a few years' time, we're suddenly going to be having high-speed bandwidth like we've never seen before, which changed the world of surgery. I spend a lot of time thinking about global health and how we improve standards. As a community here, of course, it's not just about the self. It's about being global citizens. It's about how do we impact the world when there's inequality of health care. We require billions more funding, of course. We need more surgeons. We need to shorten their training. We need to fix that problem to make health care more accessible and more equitable. And technology is moving on, and digital surgery is going to be part of that whole solution. Think about the future operating theatre or the operating room if you're in America. It's like this. It's going to be a way it's minimal. It's going to be minimalistic. It's going to have CT, MRI within the room itself. It's going to have monitors that are high definition or even 4K quality, for example. It will be connected. The surgeon will be remote on a robot doing the operation. It could be another room, for example. So that's going to be the kind of environment they work in. More importantly, that surgeon will have much more information. He'll have visuals telling him what's going on in the theatre. He'll have visuals saying, don't cut this, cut that. I recognise what you're doing because I can see with AI deep machine learning that you're going to make a mistake. It's going to have much more information about the patient in real time. So you can sensibly work out how to manage that patient during the operation. So all this data analytics is going to help us become this digital surgeon that we're describing in the future. It's important because we've got to change the subjective nature of surgery and make it more objective, more reliable to improve outcomes and education. All the technology we discussed before, all these kind of things actually have a place in surgery. And the question for us as surgeons is how do we create an ecosystem where this will survive and help us create a better world for the operating theatre and for the surgeon himself? 
A few technologies like VR. We know now, of course, from many clinical trials that VR is here to stay. VR medicine. And actually, we're looking at therapeutics of VR, whether it's stress disorders, anxieties, or even pain relief for surgery. Patients can now be offered VR therapy to avoid the unnecessary use of analgesia, reducing the requirements of pain killers during and after the operation. I've even seen a laparoscopy being done purely with VR. No anaesthetic, can you imagine? But clearly, these have a place. We're now using VR to plan surgery and to kind of plan surgery in a way we've not done before, either beforehand, preoperatively, during the operation, using MRI, CT overlay information, and also training. And Justin Barrard from also VR will talk tomorrow about VR in much more depth about training and education. Of course, with AR and mixed reality, we're moving forward. Maurizio, who's in the audience here, sent this video today. Where are you, Maurizio? He's doing some work with this planning, using images from CT MRIs, and then using 3D printing to create something prior to surgery. My friend Maki Sugimoto, working for HollowEyes in Japan, is creating overlay information in real time for surgery and implementing this as we speak in Japan, particularly in his own specialty of HPB surgery, hepatobiliary surgery. So this will make surgery more precise, more accurate. It'll guide us during the operation when we're sure about what's going on. And finally, of course, we have to have acceptance. So the FDA only last week have pushed through AR in surgery for precision surgery. So already, the implementation is taking place in front of our eyes. Education will change, of course. Education is going to be based around immersive learning because there's better retention rates. It's much better than books or online platforms. My company on the left, Medical Realities, has created the world's first interactive platform for education. And you can see from the other side of the videos that actually anatomy will change. We'll get rid of dissections, we'll get rid of cadavers, we'll be teaching using immersive learning. We'll be simulating real operations, creating haptic feedback in the future so we can shorten the time of training before we go to the operating theatre, which is better for patients, right? The moment we're learning our craft specialty in the operating theatre. That can't happen. It makes no sense to us. We can shorten the training, improve the quality and access to people in the future. So all these kind of things you'll see going forward and education will fundamentally change in the art of medicine, but particularly for us surgeons in the future. And this is going to be revolutionary as we go forward. But surgeons also need diagnostics. We use ultrasound scan all the time, don't we? We sit in the clinic and someone's got a gallstone and you send them for an ultrasound because you can't do it yourself. Yes, that wastes time. In the future, diagnostics will help us. You can scan yourself using ultrasound, but AI interface. We don't have to go for the 20 years of experience. It will tell you what's going on in the liver, in the gallbladder. Or in trauma cases, is there fluid in the belly? Is there blood? Can you spot it? It will be fast and furious, much better than we have at the moment, relying on other people to work for us. It's not just that, of course. We know AI is going to be good for all kinds of diagnosis. And we often write CT, MRI images straight away. We want some um, data back in return. And this kind of AI interface will help us enormously as we go forward to provide immediate di diagnosis. Excuse me. But let's go forward a bit further. I talk about remoteness. I do a lot of work in the third world, in Africa, in Asia, and other parts of the world. In fact, in the last three years, I've been to 30 countries looking at healthcare systems, looking at how people train, how can we improve access in war-torn zones and other places. And I think about this whole concept of going to Mars, the Elon Musk kind of vision, and with Mars 1 and SpaceX. I think there's a lot to learn from that as surgeons in terms of what access we give people. As we kind of hurtle with our Teslas into outer space, we think about what would happen if you require an operation. I happened to examine the Oxford University final year medical students. And the prize for last year, I asked them a question for the 20 or so who were the top of the tree for Oxford University finals. I said one question. Imagine 2022, you're a surgeon on their space vehicle going to Mars, and someone has appendicitis. How are you going to treat this condition? It was asked them questions about, do you know about 3D printing, about anesthesia in space? about changing volumes, pharmacology, 3D printing pills. How are we going to overcome some of the issues around remoteness? Now, of course, 3D printing is much cheaper and cheaper. And of course, in time, we'll be able to replicate that and produce our own instruments going forward. And in fact, you mentioned a few years ago, the Made in Space team sent the first 3D printer into space. One of the astronauts injured his thumb or his finger, couldn't work. So NASA sent a PDF file. He created a splint within the ISS. 
He put it on and carried on working. It's showing us we can do this not in space, but remotely in this world, where there are remote areas we still haven't accessed. But if you go back to the organ donation, we're now having a discussion about organs, the shortage, and the NHS is now thinking about having opt-out clause by 2020, which I think it will go ahead. That increased the number, but actually it'd be 3D printing that will change in the future, or regenerative medicine, which will help us overcome the shortfalls of transplantation for surgery. And here we are, this man developed a nephron, part of the kidney that's functioning, and skin is the big one, of course. We require lots of skin for plastic surgery, for the burns, for trauma, and this is the uh, kind of skin that we'll create using uh, uh, bioengineering and, of course, regenerative medicine. So transplantation will change and help us enormously in the future. Of course, human interaction will change with this whole AI interface. We're now using chatbots, AI interface. The first person you'll meet as a doctor in the future will not be a human being. It'll be an AI chatbot. It'll be somebody that looks like a, a person. It'll be humanized, but it'll be intelligent. What about voice? We haven't used voice enough. Imagine the operating theater. You need some help. You're not quite sure what to do. Go to Alexa. He'll suddenly help you. She will help you because you'll ask the question, what do I do in this situation? And they can navigate through clinical trials. So voice tech will come to every operating theater in the near future. Already, we're looking at people predicting cardiac failure uh, by a verbal. What about predicting patient outcome, listening to their voice on the smartphone, seeing how their post-operative recovery is happening, and then figuring out how to manage them going forward? We don't need to be anywhere. We can be remote. We don't have to be in the same position. This whole concept of being close has got to change. This is me doing my ward round in the past, also going to the operating theatre, remotely using the toilet present system. Do I need to be there? Of course not. You can do it all remotely. And of course, you can transport yourself in a way that we all imagine from Star Trek point of view. Actually, what we did here, I created my own uh, virtual image using photogrammetry so that we had a volumetric kind of exercise and we created a volume with this. And what we did with the HoloLens, uh, sorry, the Magic Leap, which has just come out, we did this only last week. So what I did, we put the operating theater in there. So there's vision of video of laparoscopic surgery. I created my own virtual self, which had volume. In that, I put my own skeleton inside on a CT image. So you can walk through me and see parts of me inside. It was just a skeleton, of course. Watch. So as we get through my head. See, the gallbladder is thickened. People have said I haven't got a brain. Now there's the actual proof that I'm only a skeleton inside this kind of skull of mine. But imagine if you had the whole image inside that, all the cuts of the image. So you can do amazing things with Magic Leap. I also used HoloLens a while ago to connect with people around the world using holograms, avatars in real time. Three surgeons from three continents, three time zones, connecting the operating theater in real time, discuss the case if you're in trouble. It's connecting that world that we live in because suddenly it becomes much easier with this high connection speed that you can access people's records, talk to one another as avatars. And suddenly it becomes easier to access help. The way we connect people, we communicate with people, and also to be used in teaching and training. But what about really transporting yourself? So here's me being transported in real time using holoportation. So imagine if someone wants some help in an operating theatre. You just transport yourself in real time, you appear, you give advice, and you disappear. So we can use holograms in the future, holoportation, to communicate with people in different manners. And it's all going to be coming complex as we move on. Surgery itself has become more and more complex, but we want minimally invasive surgery. This whole revolution around being more minimally invasive, being more complex with what's called a single incision laparoscopic surgery or natural orifice surgery and robotics is all going to be there. 10, 20 years ago, this was uncommon. It's become more commonplace because robots are coming in. And the whole revolution of robots is amazing. So we've got these robots that are now all coming together. There we are. So Intuitive Surgical were the main robot, Da Vinci. Now there's a plethora of robots come to the market which will democratize standards, reduce the price, and make it more affordable. I have to be an advisor for the Google Verb team, creating an advanced, sophisticated, kind of connected robot, looking at analytics and data. And also, of course, Cambridge Medical Robotics, top right, launched their robot this year, which is much more modular, smaller frame, and much cheaper as we go forward. What about eyes and kind of plastic surgery? Robots getting smaller and smaller, tiny things, incredible. Kind of, I know it's hard to watch the eye, it's really difficult, but this is what we're going to happen. Look at this minor, tiny instruments now. But this is all about technical ability. It replaces human um, surgery, 
doesn't replace actually the analytics. We can have much more data coming out of these robots will allow us to be better. What about autonomous surgeons in the future? We'll talk about autonomous doctors. Well, actually, only recently, we had the world's first autonomous surgeon doing an operation in real time, putting two bits of bow together. So we think we can't be replaced. We'll think again. We may be augmented in many ways. We'll be assisted in the operation as we go forward. The problem we have, of course, is that how do you assess people? At the moment, it's just very objective. It's subjective. We have very little objective measurements of surgical outcomes and individual performance. This is my performance. If you go to that website, you push my name in, that's me visible to the world, OK? And people come and see that, because that's my outcome for cancer work over the last three years. So that's a crude measurement, though. A mortality rate, that only tells you about death. What about all the other things that could go wrong in the operation? We need much more data that's sophisticated. You have seen the Indonesian um, flight that went down only a few weeks ago, and they re retrieved the black box, which is the orange box here. It has all the data. What about having a data box for, for surgeons? So if things go wrong, you can analyze all the data, the videos, the kind of operative details. And so now we're looking at black box in the operating theatre, which may improve insurance schemes and lessen the kind of load for patients and improve the way we monetize the situation. What about this whole thing about sensors? We talk about sensors in medicine, of course. What about in surgery? Well, actually, we look at all these sensors that we describe, whether it's an uh, eye lens from Google or a profuser kind of instruments and things, um, and also the uh, ingestibles. What do we do in surgery with these wearable sensors? Well, actually, what we're going to have to do is think about the surgeon. Could we put sensors in the surgeon? Let's find out how he's getting along both mentally and most physically, the movements he makes. What about the patient in post-op recovery? Can we measure outcomes using sensors so that post-op recovery can be targeted and specific to that patient? Absolutely possible. So I call ourselves now the quantified surgeon. From the quantified self that was described a few years ago, we have now a quantified surgeon. We have a bunch of numbers to bash out surgeons with and say, here we are, this is your data. What are you going to do about it going forward? It's all about education as well, learning, and this is me teaching using Google Glass to 14,000 people, using VR, training 55,000 people, Snapchat, 2 million people watching my operations, and of course Twitter, where I did a live operation using the tweets over the course of a day. But actually, it's not just about that. It's teaching, of course. It's how do we access uh, real-time surgery. And this is really going to be interesting. You'll love this. From the first incision to the last stitch, experience the extraordinary skill and all the drama of an operating theatre live. Their lives, his hands. Operation Live, coming soon to Channel 5. So I'll be doing the first operation, British TV, live, for the public. The whole team has been with us six weeks looking at the structure of a surgical operation, teasing out the team members, how it works together. I think it would be a great showcase if you're in the UK, log on, Channel 5, 10 p.m. on the 15th of November. And hopefully I'll, you'll see a nice operation being performed. I'm going to leave you with really what, what we're here for. We're here as a group of people in San Diego thinking about exponential change, how we help the world. The question really is all this technology and my own specialty is how do we help humanity? I'll let Sophia end for me. How do you think we should save humanity? Yeah. 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 They're the most creative creatures on the planet, but they're also the most destructive and cruel. I want to spend my time around those who are nice and kind people and help everyone work in a better, brighter future where everyone is treated well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.